And, uh, and then um, we'll actually have an opportunity for all of the finalists to come up and share with you their portfolios and talk with you about their inspirations for their, their photo uh, visualizations of uh, this theme, Framing Generation Z which is probably wide open to individual interpretation. So, uh, but we'll see what the contestants have to say about that tonight. But first, I'd like to begin um, by uh, acknowledging Phil Perry, who's the sponsor of this event, and will be here momentarily tonight, so we will introduce him again. You'll have a chance to, uh, to meet and hear from him personally, I think, for a few seconds, and, uh, and thank him for also being a sponsor of this competition as well. All right, a little background about the competition. The contestants, were given the theme before uh, last weekend. And then they walked in the door last weekend and they were given one day to execute their vision of uh, framing Generation Z, which meant that they were hitting the streets, they were thinking about how they would, what places they would go to that would help them define their concept and then try and execute that through, uh, through photojournalism and through photography. So the things that they have to keep in mind when they do this, lighting, angle, uh, composition, obviously very important, and uh, everything else, we'll hear more from the judges about that uh, momentarily as well. So um, they are given uh, five to 10 photographs to be able to express their vision of framing Gen Z. And, uh, uh, and then once they hit the deadline last weekend, they submitted their portfolios. The judges, in the meantime, have had an opportunity to go through their first uh, rounds of individually looking over those portfolios. Uh, and now that they're here this weekend, they will put their heads again uh, together once again later on tonight and talk amongst themselves and decide who our finalist and, and winner will be of the Perry Challenge. So. Uh, it's kind of a fun competition. And, uh, uh, and I actually see a few of the contestants sh smiling and shaking their heads, yes or maybe, so, um, so thank you. All right, uh, the finals will be up here momentarily. We're going to give them about five minutes to talk about their portfolios, and then the judges will have five minutes to ask any specific questions that they would like to ask of each of our contestants. So that will begin momentarily. But first, if I may, let me begin by introducing our judges tonight, and when I do, <laughs> judges, you don't have to stand up, but if you just want to turn and kind of wave a hand, and everyone will know who you are. So, uh, Alan Shaben, staff photographer from the Los Angeles Times. There we go. Alan, thank you for flying in and joining us again. Uh, Frank Franklin II, a staff photographer with the Associated Press in New York City, uh, AKA Queens, is that right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Sean Sarton, freelance journalist. Sean is here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Ann Milroy, a creative manager with Digital Sky here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and one of our graduates as well, too. Thanks, Ann, for joining us, too. Uh, Patrick Sasson, photo editor, Associated Press in New York City. Patrick, thank you. And Mike Davis, visual storyteller, consultant, editor, educator, and author. So again, judges, thank you for taking your time to, uh, to be here with us and give your feedback to our contestants as well tonight. At this point, uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, the person who heads our photojournalism program in our College of Journalism and Mass Communications, and also a good friend of mine, Sean Hill. Sean, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. So, I wanted, Mr. Perry's not here yet, but I wanted to thank him for basically this classroom and also the studio in the back. So if you guys haven't seen the studio, please, at the end of the ceremony, go back and take a look at it. Um, I'm supposed to talk about what the difference is between studio photography and photojournalism. So studio photography, the photographer is in complete control. When they go in the back there, they can set the lighting, how much lighting they want or how little lighting they want. And most importantly, they can tell the subject what to do and how to do it. They can pose them. For photojournalism, as you know, and as I tell my students, that's a no-no. We don't pose them. So in, in the studio, the photographer is the king. He can do whatever he wants, and his vision comes across. So for photojournalism, on the other hand, when a photographer goes into a situation, he has to react to whatever it is that's going on. He doesn't pose anything or anything like that. He has to react and build his vision from what is happening around him. So last weekend, the Perry 
the Perry Challenge contestants did. They recorded their 24 hours in the life of their, their subjects. So let's see what they did. Thank you, Sean. All right, we also want to introduce some of the people that have been involved in uh, putting all of this together, and they are integral to, uh, to making it happen for us here tonight. So we want to thank them, and of course, Phil Perry as well, who is the donor uh, of this uh, fantastic competition. Our scholarship committee, uh, Sean Hill, uh, Tiffany Grotlution, uh, Natalie Becerra, Bridget Grant, Maria Marin, and Caitlin Van Loon, and Andrea Gahagan. If you want to stand up, we can kind of see everybody here. Or you don't have to stand up. You want to stand up? Don't stand up. Okay. All right. Let me go get the, let's get this thing over. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. We also have Alan Eno and his class. They're the people who are responsible for uh, streaming our broadcast tonight and also creating the supporting video content that goes with that. So for Alan and his uh, students, uh, thank you for a job well done. Thumbs up. And uh, Tyler Hurst for designing the Framing Gen Z logo that you see here. And that is the, uh, the backbone and the emphasis and the theme for our competition. So fantastic. All right, let's talk with the finalists. We have uh, each of them coming up. Uh, you'll have 10 minutes, five minutes to present your portfolio. And then uh, whatever is left for judges, five minutes or less, for them to be able to ask you any questions for you to answer. So let's welcome our first finalist. Our first finalist is Meredith Gamet, a senior from Lincoln, Nebraska, a major in journalism. And uh, come on up. <laughs> one, of my, one of my students, too. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Sean says I need to turn on this clicker, so. Perfect. Awesome. Hello, my name is Meredith. I am a major in journalism and in French. Um, the reason I wanted to take on the Perry Photo Challenge is because I wanted to challenge myself and my own photography experience. And what better way to do that than to do something that's about me, something that I'm a part of, which is Generation Z. And as somebody who consumes media every day, I notice that people who write about Generation Z aren't usually Generation Z. So I really like the concept of this, and so I'm really excited to take it away. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to talk about a little more of my photo challenge. So as any journalist would do, I conducted some research. I wanted to know what researchers and other scientists were saying about our generation and what they have been picking up on. And what they started to figure out was we are the loneliest generation. Um, Psychology Today reports that this is because of our overstimulation, our use of social media, and our dependency shift. But just because of that, in us being the loneliest generation, it doesn't mean we're always that sad. <laughs> we have other things that we do. And so I wanted to show the judges through a personal story of a Nebraska college experience with a night out with the loneliest generation. So. Here we go. An evening out with the loneliest generation. So it begins with Lindsay Best, who is 21 years old, and she dances alone at a DJ, by the DJ at Junction Nightclub um, this past weekend with a vodka soda in her left hand. Best smiles enjoying her time alone on a Saturday night light. I took this from a downward angle. I wanted to get like the upward motion, the lights flashing, and I wanted to do this consistent blur throughout the entirety of the project to can create movement, like you're there. Next photo, um, it's what she's getting ready. So she's taking her angled makeup brush and she uses her Lisa Frank Morphe makeup palette, really good stuff, and to create her night out look. Um, she was following along with a TikTok video to create this look. And that's what I'm talking about with that dependency shift. We are more inclined as Generation Z to look something up before calling our mom or our dad or whoever. We're gonna look it up first. So that was her getting ready and then she was doing her hair. Um, she is originally from a suburban area in Las Vegas called Henderson and she attends the College of University in Nebraska Lincoln where she's in her final semester as a communications major. So this is when we got to the bars. Um, she's holding her lip gloss, her beer, and her vape. Lindsay Best poses in the bathroom of the arcade bar in the Haymark District here in Lincoln. 
Um, we're known for our vaping habits. Um, we have the highest percentage of e-cigarette users as compared to past generations. Um, as somebody said when they looked at this photo, she's got all the essentials for a night out. The next one, she is grabbing a handful of butter popcorn and she takes a break and she sits in the booth of Iguana's Equ Iguana's Pub. Um, it's popularly known as Iggy's here and probably one of the most well-known college bars here on campus and it's because of their cheap drinks and lack of a cover fee. So after a night out, we all get the munchies. <laughs> so this is Lindsay Best here. She's shuffling through a fridge full of half empty mustard bottles um, from her sorority house after coming home from the bars. I wanted to kind of see what the aftermath was of this. And so you guys can see, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a aftercare routine. And so as you can see here, she is taking off her makeup um, from someone else's face wash that she took. Um, as water drips down, you can see in the photo how it drips down her hands. And if she were to remove her hands, you could see the raccoon-like eyes from all the mascara and the eyeliner. And so Generation Z is also known for our skincare practices. So I wanted to capture that as well. And finally, um, this is Sunday morning, the night after, around 9, 10 a.m. And everything is quiet at her home from the previous evening out. There is a patriotic flag of rap singer Nicki Minaj that stands out prominently along the other houses on the block. This is very rare to see in the North Bottoms. Um, the North Bottoms is kind of known as a college party area um, here, kind of an escape from campus. And it's a very popular neighborhood. Um, but I wanted to show that recuperating from the night before and she's preparing for the week ahead. And She's taking a time to herself, just like most Gen Z population, and we need a moment alone before facing the world again. So that is my story. Thank you so much, judges. I really appreciate your time. All right. Um, but don't run away, because the judges may have some questions, and uh, judges, questions. Any comments or questions at this point? There being none, we'll move on. Thank you. Oh, do we have? Yeah. Just, so this was a pretty brief engagement with her. I mean, if you were able to continue, and I encourage you to do that, what, what else would you photograph? What else would you try to say through photographs? So the beautiful part about this project is she was only photographed alone. Um, but the thing with this, and if I were to continue this project, I would like to kind of touch on patterns. When you go out, you see the same things. You see repeated patterns. You see repeated patterns in what people are wearing. Girls are always wearing their black leather jackets. They got their white, gross, disgusting shoes on because they've been to so many bars and on the ground of sticky floors and all of that. So if I were to continue to do this, I'd like to capture more group photos in the sense of what you can see as a whole of Generation Z because even when I go out, I see all these repeating things, people waiting for their Ubers outside, the line outside to DP Doe on a night out. They're not even open in the morning. They're open from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. because they know what their crowd is. So just capturing those moments, um, especially even just here in a college town, um, would be where I want to take this further. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the judges? All right. Thank you again, Meredith. All right. Uh, Lydia Hernandez is our next guest and uh, finalist. Lydia is a uh, freshman from Omaha, Nebraska, advertising, public relations, and uh, sports media major. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Lydia Hernandez, and like he just said, I am a freshman. I'm majoring in sports media and communications here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And the reason I decided to um, start this photo challenge was because I do a lot of sports photography and things for social media like that, and I haven't really gotten the chance to step into the journalistic view of photography. And I really like the idea of it being 24 hours and that um, I'm just set up to, you know, whatever I see, make a story out of it, and that's kind of what I did with my story. Um, as a member of Generation Z, we have experienced so many things, global warming, pandemic, 
just mental health issues, everything around it. Um, and I wanted to kind of go around and see the people I knew around my dorm room hall and things like that and go through a day um, of their life and just see everything that they have in their life, but just the connections that it brings them back to their past. Because we often go bring trends back from the late 90s, early 2000s, and just it brings a connection and reminds us of a time where we didn't have to care what we looked like through a social media presence or just anything like that. Is this what I used to go through? I think, okay. Um, and then my title is The Things We Hold On To. So in the first image, I have freshman Sierra Upaw looking up at Memorial Stadium as she walks to Love Library to study with her friends. And she's wearing her father's Husker coat. And when I talked to her, she said, I remember going to a Husker football game when I was younger with my dad and seeing how loud the students and the fans were from the day, that day on, I knew I wanted to be a Husker. And she also said that wearing the coat takes me back to my first day on campus and reminds me how proud of my father is and how far we have, I have come. And just wearing some items, maybe from a parent or a past loved one, just kind of brings us back and reminds us of a time when things were a little bit simpler. Um, going on with the parent trend, um, she also sits in her dorm room floor, um, listening to Tom Petty's album, Highway Companion. And she often sits on, the, she said, I often sit in the front of my record player and listen to music, no skips or no distractions. It's just me, my music, and my memories. I used to do it all the time with my dad. So being able to have my collection and some of my own of my dad's records makes me feel like I'm a little girl again, sitting in front of the record player, no skips, no distractions, just music. Then we go on to Jody Soptic, who's grabbing a snowball cookie from a tin sent to her by her parents while she's working on homework at her desk. During the holidays, my family and I used to bake what we called snowball cookies all together every year. Now that I have moved three hours away, eating the cookies alone in my dorm room makes me feel like we're all together again under the same roof. And what I like about this photo is obviously we can see that I mentioned the snowball cookies, but we can see little parts of her childhood or many members of Gen Z's childhood. Like we see the Pop-Tarts up front and then your eyes move down and we see the Care Bear sticker and again her cookies. But then we also see bits of her life that she currently has now. like prepping for the rest of her college life, her working on a 132 project. Next, she's folding laundry in her dorm room floor, and again, with a connection of clothing. It's something that we wear all the time, and it brings us back. Um, she's folding her mother's um, old clothes that she used to wear when she was her age, and she said, me and my mom have been best friends ever since I was little. I used to look at photos of her wearing the same items when she was my age, and I just wanted some to be just something like her. I'm glad she gave them to me because they have become my comfort clothes and without them, I would be lost. Next, we see Ty Demand taking a photo of his friends with a digital camera and he says, when I was younger, all of my, all of my favorite family photos were taken on a digital camera. You would take the photo, capture the moment with no other distractions and no one cared what they looked like just because they were all in the moment. I feel like this is a huge trend along TikTok Instagram, everything else, of people just having that digital camera or a Polaroid camera just because it makes you feel like you're in the moment. Also, the quality of the photo is just so original. There's no editing. You can't really do anything about it. And once you've taken that photo, it's kind of over. You've captured that moment. Um, next, you see him and his friends just playing a video game, the Wii. A lot of people played the Wii when they were younger, and it just kind of brings them back. Next, we see freshman Ben Kressel as he takes time to himself picking back up on old hobbies, just bring memories back to when he was younger. Same thing, just going into another hobby of art, just being creative, painting his shoes. And then we see Liz Lures as she paints, as she puts up um, an old note from her favorite childhood book. And um, she has a handwritten note from her favorite quote from the book that her mother used to read her. And she's planning on getting it tattooed on her just so she can always have that memory that her mother loves her and just taking her back to that time. And the last photo is just her Crocs sitting at the edge of her bed. Um, she says that she always wore Crocs when she went to her grandparents' lake and it just takes her back. And Crocs have become a huge trend among all of Generation Z. And I think it's really just because it kind of brings you back to when you were younger. You could just play in the mud, get a little grass stains on your knees, didn't really have to worry about what anybody else said. That's it. Thank you, judges. All right.
Hold on one second. We'll, we'll find out uh, questions from the judges. Comments? I always ask questions. <laughs> I'm curious after the feedback uh, from earlier today and seeing your work in a different space, what do you think is working about it and how would you improve it if you were to do it again? If I were to do it again, I would definitely try to focus on one subject and maybe take a deeper look into all of the items in their life that take us back. Because as I was talking to my subjects, I was maybe coming up with ideas for them, but then I kind of just stopped and let them think for themselves. And there were so many things like the tattoo in her childhood book that she used to read with her mom. I never knew that about her, and I've known her for 10 years. So it's just nice to get to know your subjects and things that you've never known about them, even though you've maybe known them your whole life. So I'd maybe try to focus on one person and see all the details of their life that I've maybe missed out on. Um, I, you, this is the first time we get to hear your voice when talking about your project, and um, I'm doing this right. Um, but uh, I'd ever considered the nostalgia uh, part of this. Um, what are some of the challenges of trying to illustrate nostalgia for you? Um, sorry, I don't know if I need that, right? You do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like trying to generate nostalgia is kind of, you know, you see something as maybe for you guys looking at it is a little bit different, but I, for some of the younger people from Generation Z, seeing it pointing out, you're like, I remember that. I remember sitting in my basement playing the Wii all night or, I remember on the table, I never mentioned it, but she had like a little thing of Play-Doh, like just playing with those little things. But generating it, the nostalgia is kind of different for, for everybody. So um, that's why I like to capture the parts of like their parents' lives that they still bring with them, just because it you know, brings them back a little bit or maybe the p stories that their parents told them and they kind of want to rekindle that relationship. Yeah, you know, to pick up on the nostalgia thing, um, do you think the, the nostalgia, you like your, the, all this old technology and the mementos from the parents, do you think that's more prominent in Generation Z than, than previous generations? Honestly, I think so. We're coming in such a new technology age where a lot of things are different. I feel like um, there was like a steady pace of just kind of the same technology. Things kind of weren't improving. And once you hit like late 90s, early 2000s, things kind of started to skyrocket and we had to grow up learning. I mean, everybody had to grow up learning those things, but we were so young. Like I learned how to use a computer when I was three, four years old and I learned how to use a camera, a digital camera when I was like 10. So there's a lot of different things, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know for sure. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Jordan Moore joins us next, and Jordan is a junior and from Lincoln, Nebraska, and a journalism major. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Moore, and the title of my photo essay is Possessions. So by definition, a possession is an item of property but it's also a state of being controlled. And in a world of dominating materialism and overconsumption, what possessions does a younger generation actually value? And so to explore this topic, I ask people in my life to tell me what their favorite thing that they own is, and then I take pictures of them with that and sort of explain the importance of their possessions in their lives. So first, this is Isabel Sheasley. Uh, she's 20 years old, and she's holding a portrait of her great-grandmother. She told me that her favorite item that she owns is her great-grandmother's ring, um, and it's her class ring from 1932. And I decided to frame her with her grandmother's portrait because it shows the resemblance and her deep connection that she has with her family. And again, just that resemblance of her looking into the photo and having the ring there just showing the deep connection that she has with her family um, and just highlighting that um, between multiple generations. Next, this is Maya Miller. Um, she is 21 and a junior at the university. Um, and she told me that her favorite object is a ceramic mug that she bought at an art sale. She said, I love its little details and the way the handle feels when I hold it. She told me that this 
um, item inspired her to create her own ceramic pieces. So again, just that importance of being connected to a larger art community. And um, as she says, it represents the beginning of her journey in creating her own pieces. And so that is why it's her favorite object. Next, this is Sam Spethman. He's 20 years old. And he told me that his favorite object that he owns is his record collection. And he says that his collection is sort of a representation of himself and it reminds him of memories of when he first listened to the music and just sort of that connection that he has to the past but also to the future. Um, and again, he just says it's something that has a lot of strong memories associated with it and it's sort of just a representation of who he is um, through music. Next, this is Anna Steinhausen. She's 21, and she told me that her favorite object is a fur coat that she bought at a thrift store. Um, she says, I feel like myself in it, and it's rare that I feel represented by the clothing that I wear. And I feel like with Generation, Generation Z, we are very materialistic in terms of overconsumption um, and fast fashion, and that's definitely a big problem that we have um, because we have, we have so much just accessibility to just online shopping that can lead to not feeling connected to the clothes that we wear. So finding a unique piece like this and feeling like yourself in it is very important. Lastly, this is Delaney Young. They're 21 um, and they said that their favorite thing is their clothes in their closet. And I decided to put these two as last because I feel like they connect to each other on a way that clothing can be representative of who we are and our personality and just our unique style, and that collecting unique pieces um, and owning them makes it feel more genuine, and we feel more connected to it, and it just feels more special. Um, so all in all, our possessions tell the story of who we are, and my photo essay shares a story of belonging, connection, and an appreciation for the things that surround us every day. Thank you. Judges. Comments, questions? I want to, wait, 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 he's thinking. <laughs> okay. I'm just curious on this photo, um, she's sitting among, or they are sitting among their clothing. Did you remove the clothing? Was it like that? Um, so are you asking if this is how it looked when we, yeah. So um, when, <laughs> when, we, um, when I met with them, um, I just sort of sat and asked, like, what would you like me to take pictures of you with? And they started talking about their clothes and just opened the closet door and it was like that. And they just got in and sat in it. And it was just a natural thing. Um, so yeah. Um, can you talk about? Um, the, the choice of using portraiture um, for this for this um, contest um, that's a bold choice I mean like it's not a traditional journalism path um, what led you to, to use this you know this path to do this yeah for sure I think with my interpretation of the theme and with the theme being generation Z I feel like having a face to the item is so important because I feel like each unique face with their item just tells their story fully and I think, with, especially with the captions and everything, I think that it really comes across as this is the generation and here are a few faces that you can put these items to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jordan Moore. All right, Amber Rodriguez is next. Amber is from uh, Papillion, Nebraska, a junior and a major in journalism. All right, thank you so much. Um, I have an anxiety disorder, so I will do my best, honestly. <laughs> um, so my story is called Beyond the Binary, and it's about gender identity and Gen Z, and how we've defined how complex of a concept it is. Um, my girlfriend, Olivia, and my friend, Mari, they're in the back there. They were my subjects to represent this challenge, and I really appreciate them 
being very open about gender identity because that's a very personal subject to us. Um, Generation Z is notorious for breaking rules and paving the way for freedom of gender identity and expression. Although LGBTQ rights have expanded since this generation's birth, a slew of anti-trans bills across the nation, including Nebraska, are threatening the marginalized community of LGBTQ youth and adults. 39 states have proposed anti-trans bills, last time I checked. A glimpse into the lives of two young adults in the transgender community of Lincoln, Nebraska, represents a margin of those exploring their gender identity, embracing the journey, rebelling against the hate, and fighting for the future generations. Now, I know I may not be showing a universal experience of Gen Z at a surface level, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to amplify the voices that we usually don't hear. So these are my two friends. Uh, this is my girlfriend, Olivia. She identifies as a transgender woman and uses she, her pronouns. This is my friend, Mari. Uh, she identifies as a demigirl, which is, means you partially identify as a female. And they use they, she pronouns. And so I wanted them both sitting at the steps of the lobby of the apartment building that we all share. We just live on different levels, so it's pretty fun. Um, and I really wanted to show that we're just tight-knit friends of the LGBTQ community. And they also gave their input on how Gen Z did like add neo-pronouns in this complex idea of gender, but they also wanted to give credit to the generations before, um, but at the same time, the generations that don't understand. And so now I wanted to represent um, my girlfriend's weekly routine as a transgender woman. Um, she started her HRT therapy, that's when you transition using hormones, in May of 2021. And ever since, she's noticed like physical changes in her body, like smoother skin, thinner hair. And this is a really important moment because this is very personal because facial hair does give her dysphoria. And although this may look like a simple routine, there's still emotions behind that. I wanted to swap back and forth between both of my subjects to show a little bit of the beginning of the journey and show how they evolved rather than going first subject for the first portion, second subject, the second portion. And so this is Mari. Um, before they got accepted to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, they took a photo on the football field and then you could see how different they look now, which is how they even like present themselves. So there's a smile on their face and like what they're wearing now. Um, and that's really big because they also work for Husker Vision and all that. So just evolving as a person and just physically seeing that. This was kind of hard to take um, because they didn't have a physical photo. So I kind of wanted to show a little bit of how we also have photos on our phone. They're like, yeah, I had this photo, but I don't have a physical picture. So we're back to Olivia's routine. Um, her using makeup and putting on black eyeshadow and everything. Um, she's also shirtless as well um, as she started like HRT and started wearing, being more comfortable with bras and things as part of the transgender journey. Um, and here she quotes, um, doing makeup at first, it was kind of scary at first, uh, Campizano said, I only ever did it late at night in my bedroom, but I was able to work on my confidence over time to go out in public. Um, and I also really wanted to play along with shadows when it came to the bathroom setting. So we go back to my friend Mari, and when it comes to the idea of dysphoria, sometimes it's not this or that. And so Mari deals with like a complex love-hate relationship of their breasts as an assigned female at birth who wants to be perceived at genderless at times. Most people think it's just this or the other, when in reality, this is how complex it is. Um, Mari says, I have those days where I don't have a chest at all or would rather have a flat chest. But then there are those days where I do and I'm happy that I have my boobs. I definitely enjoy my femininity side and that's okay. But the more I start to get comfortable with my own body, the more I realize that androgynous is definitely what I'm going for. And I also wanted to show um, how they're a little bit edgy with all the jewelry and the 2001 tattoo as well that represents Gen Z. 
And so this is both my girlfriend and Mari just having fun and dyeing uh, Mari's hair. Mari has dyed their hair, I think, at least three or four times this entire school year. <laughs> um, and so honestly, we're just having a good time. And like, body modifications, tattoos, piercings, that is all definitely Gen Z through and through. And so body modification hair dye helped me achieve my overall aesthetic, Pilling said. Short hair has always been my kind of go-to. I always have a fun time exploring with haircut. But now that I'm older, I have a better time exploring the hair color and just who I am, who I feel on the exterior, making sure the exterior matches interior as well. That is a very important quote um, when it comes to gender identity. Now for this photo, when I first met uh, my girlfriend Olivia, she opened the drawer and I see so many meds in this drawer. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she was like, yeah, I've been collecting these meds since I started my HRT transition in May of 2021. And ever since then, I'm like, how could I not include this as part of her story? Um, and so she lays on her transgender flag with over 40 HRT medications and accumulate these, um, she accumulates these each month. And I'm serious, we live together. She still has a drawer full of meds. And so she said, the day I start HRT is incredibly important to me because it's when the new me was born, who I am now and who I wanna be. My final form as person would be to be someone that is easy to trust or be comfortable around. I wanna make the trans youth feel safe around me as well as any trans adult or person that needs to feel safe. Um, so a couple of the last photos, Mari was doing her makeup, and then these other two photos are really the reason why I wanted to do this story. Um, I wanted to end on a serious note that this is the reason of Gen Z. We're known for protesting bills that honestly go against human rights as a whole, and it's very concerning. This is a real issue, and I really wanted to take that opportunity. And thank you so much for checking out my story and allowing me to share my art with you all. All right, thank you, Amber. Uh, comments, questions? <laughs> okay. I'm curious about um, how you arrived at photographing something specific. What was that conversation like, the interaction? Um, I think it's really because I have such a close relationship with my friends and we've had so many in-depth conversations about gender, di gender identity as well because I'm also discovering my own connection with my gender as well. Um, and so honestly, I had them, we just had a conversation. We're just like, hey, so tell me about like where you started and like all that. And so if they had like some certain items and I wanted to take a photo of that, um, the capital of photos just needed to be photos there because of all the protests that are going on in legislation. As far as hair dye, uh, my friend Mari just wanted to dye her hair, so. <laughs> um, my, my question is, or is this um, a project that you'll continue to work on? Absolutely, without a doubt. All right, we have uh, one more finalist, and that is Hayden Rooney, a sophomore from Lincoln, Nebraska, and a uh, broadcasting major. Hello, my name is Hayden Rooney. As, as you said, I'm a broadcasting major sophomore here. When framing Gen Z, I first thought about what makes my generation who we are. What are we obsessed with? What defines us? What problems do we face as a generation? And I went, when I went to go Google it, it brought up caricature things like uh, isolation, technology obsessed, and lazy. And I just kind of read that and cringed because I was like, that's not really who we are. We're, we're humans in the end. So I just asked my friends kind of like, what do you think defines us? What problems do you have? And as we had that discussion, food was a huge topic that was always brought up. You know, having to check your bank account before you go to the grocery store, rationing out the uh, 
groceries that you're going to get and then getting home and putting them in your fridge and realizing, oh my God, how am I going to make it two weeks? So uh, my photo essay, Hunger of Youth, showcases the older members of Generation Z and how they're plagued with questions regarding their future, including way wondering where their next meal will come from, how much can they ration, and for how long. This essay showcases university students in Lincoln as they reveal their struggle with food security, showing how inflation rates and the economic impacts of COVID-19 are redefining their generation's economic needs. So I first opened up here, by the way, this is the profanity warning. There will be a lot in the captions. So this is one of my acquaintances, Nick. Um, and I just said, hey, do you want to go grocery shopping? And he was like, sure, where, do, where can we go? Fun fact, I called every grocery store in Lincoln and the Super Saver on North 27th was the only one cool with taking pictures because the owner was a JOMC grad from like 20 years ago. So anyway, I told him that and he said, Super Saver, you can't save shit at Super Saver. And he was kind of reluctant to go, but he did. With this first photo, I wanted to literally frame Gen Z uh, by kind of framing him here with these lines, the cart, and then waiting till he matched up with the top symbols there. So with this one again, you're very cautious, you know, when you're trying to spend on a budget. So he saw a three for five deal in the chip aisle and he started feeling around and I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, we got to feel around for the air. That's how you know how much scam they put in here. <laughs> He's quite a character. But he was examining and making sure like, oh, which one am I actually going to get a good deal from and finally found three. So this one was kind of the bill at the end here. Um, with this, this is just the super saver checkout screen. And you see he's kind of buying the essentials here. You got your cans of tomatoes, your baked beans, stuff like that. But I really, really noticed was the EBT before cash. This is the food stamps that we have here. Um, it's, I thought it was interesting kind of how they were acknowledging themselves. Like, yeah, this is kind of expensive, you know, just so you know. We know that this is a thing you guys are taking uh, advantage of. And this is Jamie. So what I wanted to do with these photos was surround them with the aisles. Um, one of the judges said, uh, you know, it's just grocery shopping. It's just, it's just grocery shopping. But kind of when you think about food at this age and rationing stuff out, it's not just grocery shopping, it's stress. You know, how much can I do? How much can I get away with? And all of that. So I kind of wanted to surround them with the stress as well. Um, I really like this photo because I saw down the aisle, we have a lady here with a mask on and it just reminded me of COVID immediately. Anytime I see someone with a mask, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's uh, uh, no good. <laughs> but essentially COVID-19 is behind the subject and we're looking forward. This is Nick here again. Um, we were just kind of talking about prices and stuff. And I was like, what do you do when you look for a good prices? So he was like, oh, I'll take this bread here. And he grabbed it and he went, 245 for bread? Fuck out of here. Where's that cheap shit? Oh, they don't got no cheap shit. So it was, it was kind of funny. But it's just, he, he just put it back and walked away. He didn't grab anything. He's like, no, I'm not doing that. This is Jamie here. So with this photo, I really wanted to, even though it's from a low angle, make Jamie feel a little small with the depth here because with this like food problem, you, it feels so isolating. Like you're like the only one that has it or it's like, oh, I can't afford this. It sucks to be me, I don't wanna talk about it. But when I talk about other people, they're like, oh, you have that problem too. Oh, you're also on food stamps. So I thought when you're in that grocery store and you're looking at the bill and you're like, God, I just feel so alone. So I wanted that kind of feeling with this photo. Uh, here, I have a picture of the fridge at Super Saver with all sorts of markdown prices of stuff, which are more expensive than last year still. But um, kind of we'll move on. The, there's a parallel later that I wanted to do. So this is just him going away. So he, he uh, loaded up $21.44 worth of food into the trunk of his car. And I asked him, like, so how long is this going to last, do you think? And he's like, well, I'll try to push it two weeks. You know, it's probably a week's worth, but I could probably push it to two. So, and this is loading in. Jamie says, 
I try not to get everything at once because I'm still waiting to get paid. So I'll probably come back in like a week and a half or something. And then this is the fridge of a student. It's a little different than the Super Saver one. Thank you for listening. Thank you, judges, for all the amazing critiques. Any questions? Sorry, I stole your line. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Comments, questions, judges? All right. I guess not. Okay. I mean, you know, your record, you have a record to maintain. And you can't get off the hook. I would have fell I mean, so if you were going to continue this, and again, based on comments today, I hope you do, what would you do differently and what would you move it forward? So I wanted to follow Nick home, but his roommate, oh, I wanted to follow Nick home and kind of see what was going on there because he was describing the situation and he has these crazy roommates and all this. And I kind of wanted to get that feel, you know, maybe see him cook something. But he said he had complications and was like, no, he probably better not come today. So if I were to continue this, I'm going to his house and then um, hopefully talking to someone at corporate at hy V because they said that's what I had to do. So just going to other stores and getting a different sense. Um, I guess one shot that I really wanted to get that I didn't include was like a really ultra wide shot in an aisle. Just I wanted to give it a lot of perspective. Super Saver is just kind of odd. So maybe a different store would help. Thank you, Hayden. All right. Okay, our finalists again, Hayden, Amber, Jordan, and Lydia, and Meredith. So the judges will now take the next 20, 25 minutes for uh, deliberations, and we want to thank them again, uh, Alan, Sean, Frank, and Patrick and Mike. So thank you very much. We're going to excuse the judges. They're going to convene in privacy, and um, we also encourage all of you uh, to step out of the room. We have some refreshments right around the corner here, and uh, we'll meet back here in roughly 20, 25 minutes. So enjoy yourselves, judges. Uh, go to it, and uh, we'll come back, and we'll, we'll uh, announce the uh, three placers.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Perry Photo Challenge from the Perry Family Classroom here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the College of Journalism and Mass Communication. So the judges have had their final deliberations, and they have decided which three of our five finalists will be recipients of scholarship assistance, and everybody will be uh, honored with uh, a trophy of some type. So. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce our Dean, Sherry Vale, who uh, has done a fantastic job uh, making events and experiences like this happen for our students and for our faculty, and uh, I'm going to turn over the reins to Sherry right now. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Barney, and thank you all for coming tonight. This has been really fun to see families here as well and friends coming out to support each other, as well as contestants who were involved in earlier parts of the competition and came in to see the finalists uh, give their show. I really want to thank our judges for coming in and spending so much time and giving such great feedback to the students, over for some of you, over this last week uh, so that they could have some some tips on improving their photography moving forward as well. So for Frank and Patrick, welcome to Lincoln, Nebraska. We're glad you came. Thank you, Sean, for bringing them in. And then, of course, to Anne and to Al and Sean and Mike, welcome home. Uh, for students who are here, it's nice to see that there are alumni out with incredible careers doing amazing things in this area and you can look forward to what you can become as well as a graduate of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications. I especially want to thank Phil and Roseanne Perry uh, for sponsoring the Perry Photo Challenge. I think it's important to know, for our students to know as well, uh, our budget, 97% of the college's budget, goes to faculty and staff salaries and benefits, which leaves us 3% for phones, copy machines, operations. So events like this, spaces like this, would not be possible without people like Phil and Roseanne Perry. So thank you to the Perrys. Phil and Roseanne are not graduates of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications, so I can't do what I do to Alan, you know, invoke memories of George Tuck to get him to come back and do things. They are sponsors because they're invested in our future, in our students. They want to provide students with an opportunity to level a playing field. You all had the exact same time the exact same equipment, the exact same opportunity. And it is with your hard work and determination and talent that allowed you to get this far. And I think those are also qualities that have made Phil very successful as well. So it's great to see that come out in our students. And I just want to tell you, for all of those who have been involved throughout this process, keep in mind that everyone had the opportunity to sign up. Not everyone did. Not everyone made it to the first day of shooting. And not everyone made it to get in their photos in time. So you really had to do a lot of work to get to this point. And I just want you to know, I'm so proud of you. Just know what you can accomplish with that hard work, with that determination, and how you can cheer each other on. So it's great to have all of you here tonight. I'm delighted to announce our uh, should I go through the top five? I gotta look for my coordinators. Do we wanna bring up all of the finalists first for them to receive their awards? All right. So we will start by bringing everyone up to receive the, your trophy, because all finalists do receive one. We will start with Meredith, if you would come up. Get Caitlin and Sean ready to take the pictures as well. <laughs> All right, next we will have Lydia. Yes. 
And then we have Jordan. A man or Amber. <laughs> and Hayden. And now for our finalists, third prize and a $1,000 scholarship goes to Amber Rodriguez. And second prize and a $2,000 scholarship goes to Jordan Moore. <laughs> and first prize and a seven thousand dollar scholarship goes to Meredith Gamet. <laughs> tears and excitement. You have a whole cheering squad over here, Meredith. <laughs> it has been my pleasure to have you all here in the College of Journalism and Mass Communications for this competition. Thank you to our committee who has been here working on this tirelessly for much longer than most of us have paid attention to the Perry Challenge. They've been working very hard behind the scenes. Also to Jamie Wentz, who's probably behind a screen somewhere out there. <laughs> Jamie is our technical director. He uh, makes sure that all of the details work out for this live streaming. That's also through Alan Eno's class. Just really hard work of folks to make this happen. Thank you to Barney, who has been our diligent host throughout this evening. And then also, of course, our judges, uh, for coming in and spending your time with us, and then to the Perrys for coming and supporting our students and supporting this challenge. And last but not least, thank you to our students for coming in, putting in the hard work, showing what you can do here, and really making a difference. And we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. So uh, that concludes uh, year number four of the, the Perry Channel uh, Challenge, and thank you again for all coming out. And really, uh, we couldn't do this without your support and the support of all of our students, obviously, too. But uh, every year, we have more people come back and uh, participate uh, as an audience and help support our college. And of course, all of those people out there who are watching this via stream around the world. So thank you for tuning in as well tonight. Until next year, good night. <laughs>